you have your Bibles, take them and open them to uh, the book of Genesis, chapter number 12. We're continuing our study on faith and blessing. Faith and blessing. Now, the greatest day for each and every one of us is the day that we uh, trusted Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. No day can compare to that because that's the day that, uh, that uh, all the uh, ugliness of sin and death was over. We were on a new road from that day, a road that would take us from where we were found in our sin and would carry us all the way to the presence uh, face to face, no longer walking by faith but walking by sight, absent from the body, present with the Lord in the splendor of the goodness of God, the pureness of the nature of God, not being hindered in any way from seeing His love and His glory, His joy and His peace, the majesty, the, the adoration of who God is bestow for us because before there was time, God was there. But He wanted a plan so that you and I could have life but spend that life with Him. And the day that we came to know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, the greatest decision we ever made, we began that journey of walking with Him. And we, we, we grow in the grace of God every day. We go through the circumstances of life. By the way, we've had some circumstances, haven't we? And, and we go through difficulties. Anybody had any difficulties? Anybody had any hiccups along the way? Anybody had any uh, question marks? Anybody wondering... What's next? Well, God's got all that figured out. And he's going to take us in. You don't have to be perfect the day you were saved. You were forgiven the day you were saved. Amen? And, and from that point forward, it's, it's learning what it means to know God. Learning what it means to trust God. Learning what it means that, that he is your Savior and your Lord and your Master. And praise God, your friend. I don't know about you, but I need a friend. I need a friend that will stick closer than a brother. I need a God who knows me and loves me anyway. Oh, what a Savior we have in Jesus Christ. And Abraham, here in Genesis 12, he has heard from God. He is now following God, but he's not yet there. Anybody there yet? I don't know where the there is, but I know I'm not there yet. I haven't gotten everything figured out yet. I'm not there. I don't know all the answers. I'm not there. But I'm walking with the one who is. Amen? Genesis 12. Are you there? Say amen. Stand with me in honor of reading God's word. Genesis 12, verse number 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarah's wife, Indeed, I know you are a woman of beautiful countenance. That's kind of a sideways compliment, because look what happens next, verse 12. Therefore, it will happen when uh, the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. You know, fear is a liar. Y'all know that? And he's been overwhelmed with fear, and because he's following fear, he, he steps out into sin. Verse 13, Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for my sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. How she must have been. She was probably about between 65 and 70 years of age at this particular point in time. Ladies, you're still beautiful. Amen. Man, you missed a great op opportunity. You could have just shouted, that's right. <laughs> Amen. The princes of Pharaoh always saw, oh, verse, anyway, uh, the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues, because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh 
commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray now that you will bring blessings upon your word. It is the word that was given to us. And Lord, we thank you for it. Now, Father, speak to us personally through your word. Jesus, you're the living word, so you speak in our lives. Come close. We know that you're there. We pray, Lord, no hindrances. We pray, Lord, that we will have ears to hear, a mind that's open, a heart willing to accept. Father, the blessings that you have prepared before the foundations of the world, even for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God had a plan for Abram, a plan of blessing. It began in Ur of the Chaldees, and there were some circumstances and situations there. Abram's brother passed away. We don't know all the reasons, but, but God spoke to them in those dark times, and they left all that paganistic society behind, all those troubles behind, and said from the very beginning, at the end of chapter 11, said they were going to Canaan land, promised land, the land that God had set aside for them. Now, he began the journey with his earthly father, Terah, being with him. And they got part of the way, and they stopped. They paused. And Terah, the word means to pause, really, he, he passed away. But after he passed away, God came to Abram again, spoke to him plainly and clearly again. And the journey he began with his earthly father, he now had to continue with his heavenly father leading the way. Look at the promises again in chapter 12. Look in verse 1. He says, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I'll be the one, to, I'll be your map. I'll direct you. Just walk with me. Verse 2, I will make you a great nation. You can't do that on your own. But I promise you, I will do that. I will bless you. The God that we serve is a God of blessing. If you're angry at God, if you don't understand God, I promise you, you may be the one with the problem, not him. He is a God of love. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loved you enough to send his son from heaven to come down here to, to have to humble himself, to empty himself of all the glory that he had had from time eternity past. He laid all that down, took on the form of a servant, even to the place of the cross, died a sinner's death that he did not deserve because he had never sinned, not even once. He gave his life a ransom. He allowed them. He, he died. They put him in the grave to put an end, but that was only the, the end of the beginning. The beginning came when he took his life back, and he became the ransom for our sins. He became our salvation, and we have new life in him. Everything is good. He came to bring blessings. He said to Abraham, I'll make you a great name. There are so many people living to perform a great name down here on earth. Man, that's going to be nothing. That's going to be nothing. It's going to pass away. But if God gives you a great name, you've really got something. He said you will not only receive the blessing, but you'll be a blessing to others. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. He is saying, I'll be your blessing as I am with you. I will bless everything. When people come and they bless you, I'll be there. If they stand against you, understand, I'll be there. I'll be your blessing. He says, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram began this journey, and what a journey it must have been when he began to walk into Canaan land. Come on, let's just think about it for a moment. He saw those beautiful mountains and the hills and the valleys and the lush green grass and the animals that were there, and the, and the foliage, and, and all the crops that were there, and, and everything was so beautiful. It, it is described later as the land flowing with milk and honey. The place of abundance that God had for him. He took him away from the Ur of the Chaldees and brought him to this place so he could enjoy it. It was a land of promise, a land of blessing, a land of wonder and grace. And, and, and that's why every time Abram stopped, he built an altar there because it was a, a time of his heart overflowing in worship of the great God of the universe who spoke to him personally and loved him. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful God. 
What a wonderful thing. You know, I want you to understand and know that God has blessings for you too. No matter what. Y'all listening? But something happened. Look what it says in verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. A drought. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, we were talking about that this week, said, unto each life some rain must fall. Well, I tell you what, in North Georgia in June and July, it's going to rain about every day, amen? I mean, every day that it gets hot in the afternoon, we're going to get a little rain. But you know, we need that because the crops are out there and they're growing. And with this great heat that makes the ground uh, warm and, and, and makes it great for the crops to come up. If we don't get the rain, they're just going to dry up. They're just going to scorch right then and there, and that's what was happening. The, the summer crops just dried in the field. You know, a few years ago, I, I can't remember, I think it was 2016, we had 70-something days of just no rain. Y'all remember that? I mean, it rained in the spring, and it rained in May, and in June and July, and we said, Man, we're going to wrinkle up. We're getting so much rain. But when, when the spigot got turned off, it just stopped, didn't it? And August was hot and dreary in September. What a difficult time that was. But you see, it extended past the summer for them. And the latter rains that, that make the, the grass green and lush and prepare for the spring harvest as well. Nothing. Nothing. And it didn't take too long until all of a sudden the drought becomes what is known as a famine. A famine is defined as no food. And the richness that everything that God had, if God turns off the blessing, it's just a time of devastation and difficulty. You know, Longfellow may have said unto each life some rain must fall, but Maybe we could also say, unto each life, there will also be a little bit of a drought, a little bit of a famine, a little bit of a difficulty, a little bit of hardship. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been through hardship? Anybody ex 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 experiencing some difficulty? Things that you wouldn't want to have to go through? Things that you would uh, not even want your worst enemy to have to go through? Darkness, uncertainty that's there? Seems to be there. Seems to be around everywhere. But you know, we can't live on the <clears throat> mountaintop forever. We can't live up there. The growth happens when we move to the valley. Or excuse me, the growth happens in the valley. I start thinking about some of the people that we know of in God's Word. Abram's great-grandson. Y'all might know him by Joseph. His brothers didn't like him too much. They were going to kill him. But one of them said, no, no, let's, let's make some money off of him. And some, a, a, a caravan on the way to Egypt came by, and they sold him into slavery. And what a terrible journey that must have been with his heart broken every step of the way. They get to Egypt. He's put on a slave block, and he's sold again. A man by the name of Potiphar buys him. And he's a slave. But Joseph wants to do the right thing. And God honors that and God blesses that. Matter of fact, everywhere Joseph went, God honored him and God blessed him. But it, his circumstances went from bleak to more bleak. Even in Potiphar's house, circumstances turned on him and he found himself thrown in jail. Not only thrown in jail, he honors God there in jail. But even then, he is forgotten. How can you... Find yourself in the, the faraway country in the worst of circumstances and you don't think anyone even knows that you're around. But God knows. And God promised blessing no matter what. You see, it's easy to look at those circumstances and say, God, I don't understand. God, God what are you doing? I thought you said you would honor. I thought you said that you were going to bless. Well, he took Joseph from that station and made him second only to Pharaoh. And by the way, there was another drought. It was prophesied seven years of great bounty to be followed by seven years of drought. 
And even then, God was there in the drought and God was there in the bounty so that all would know that he is God. I think about Daniel, taken as a young teenage boy, probably 14, 15 years old, taken away from his family, taken to Babylon to be a slave that was there. But God grew him there. God built character in his life there in those circumstances. And when it was time, when they needed a word from God, when they needed something that was the plumb line, it was truth, someone needed to let them know what truth was, Daniel was the one who stepped up, and God used him mightily. Even his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't want to have to go through that. But when, when Daniel's faithfulness put him in harm's way, God was with him in the lion's den. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faithfulness found them about to be thrown into a fiery furnace, God was with them in the fiery furnace. That's not one thing that they woke up that day and said, this is what I planned for this day. I just can't wait to have a fiery furnace. But God was with them. I think about Esther and the circumstances that got Esther there to where she became queen. And yet that racist bigot, Haman, wanted to kill all the Jews out of hatred, racial hatred. But Mordecai, Esther's cousin, encouraged. And I love that verse in Esther. It says, for such a time as this, maybe what God's doing today is for such a time as this. Maybe in your difficulty and in your pain and in your hardship and in the brokenness that we're all facing, maybe God wanted us here for such a time as this. Maybe there's an opportunity that we will have that, that will absolutely bless a generation. May God do it. May we not miss an opportunity. Because you grow during these times. So what do you do during drought times, during hard times? I've got three quick things I want you to see. Number one, humble yourself before God. I know that sounds common. You've probably heard it many times. But you know the one thing I know about humility? We don't seek it. We seek honor. Don't y'all look righteous at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, we seek blessings. We love it when people sing our praises, don't we? I was sitting up there in the balcony in between the services, and some people were down here talking. They didn't know I was sitting up there, and they were bragging on me. And I felt like saying amen from the portals, but I didn't say a thing, you know. <clears throat> we all like to hear the good stuff, right? But what we need to do during the drought times, during the hard times, is we need to seek humility. Humble yourself. The word humility means this. It means to see yourself the way God sees you. You may see yourself here. If God sees you here, this is a lie. This is the truth. But it's not only to see, how, see yourself the way God sees you. Listen, it's to see your circumstances the way God sees them. How many of you have ever thought you got a bad break? How many of you thought something didn't go the way that you wanted? Well, I don't understand. I, I deserve this, or God, God should have done this for me, or I, I just don't understand this. I was faithful to you, God. Why did, no, hold on. Humility that we should seek with our heart means we look at ourselves and value ourselves the way God sees us, but also our circumstance, our walk. John the Baptist was a great man because he was okay serving God in the way that God called him. By the way, the one that he was after, Elijah, a great man of God, a man of God with the power that could pray, and, and, and once again, it not rain for three and a half years. Pray, and the fire from heaven could fall. Pray, and that rain would come back. You don't fight against that. Humility says, this is what God has for me. This is who I am. This is where he put me. Amen. Hallelujah. I may not understand it. 
It may be a lion's den. It may be a heated furnace. It may be Job. Nobody wants to trade places with Job, but God allowed it. And I'm grateful for it because Job taught us this. He is worthy of our praise no matter what. On the good times, praise his name. On the bad days, do the same. In everything, give the king of kings all the praise. We wouldn't know that in that way if we did not have the example of somebody like Job walking before us. Humble yourself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do we do that? Usually we trust in ourselves as long as the sun's shining and the rain's coming and the money in the bank and got a good job, you got friends, got a wife that loves you like I do. Why do I need to trust in the Lord? I've got everything I need. Hold on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. I don't know about you, but as long as I'm leading in, leaning on my understanding, I'm going to walk with the strength of my wisdom. And I know one thing, that's not enough. And always acknowledge him. In your circumstances, acknowledge him. In the pandemic, acknowledge him. In your financial situation, acknowledge him. When the doctor says one thing, acknowledge him. I don't care what the test says, but I do care what God says. You hear me? And he'll direct your path. You humble yourself. And the second word I want you to see is the word lowly. Now, humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you, seeing your circumstance the way God sees you. And you need to seek that. But you also need to seek lowliness because lowliness is the opposite of haughtiness, arrogance, and pride. So if I've got anything in my life that I'm lifting up higher than God getting the glory, that's wrong. How many of you have ever been knocked to your knees? Let me just say it to you. How many of y'all been knocked to your knees? That's a good place to be. You can pray there. You can pray there. But why do we have to wait for circumstances to do that? Why can't we lower ourselves? Lowliness. The third thing we need to do is pray. I think we take this for granted oh so much. We need to pray. How am I going to know what God has to say unless I go to him in prayer? Oftentimes, we don't pray when everything's going our way. Something goes wrong, then we, we, then, we, then we pray. Well, Abram found himself in a famine, and he heard about this place named Egypt where everything was going good. Did he go pray about it? Presumption said, well, that's the obvious thing to do. Go do it. Be very careful. Be very careful about presuming on the will of God. You need to hear it from him. God got him there. God provided every step of the way. The first crisis that comes up, he didn't think the God who got him there could provide for him while he was there. I need to leave and go someplace else. You see, he didn't know that much about God yet. He hadn't learned that. So God allowed him to go through some circumstances to where he would learn those things. Prayer. Don't presume. Pray. Y'all want to hear Jesus' words on this? John chapter 5, verse 30 says this. This is Jesus' quote. I can of myself do nothing. Now that sounds almost disrespectful for me to say that, don't it? But I didn't say that. He said that. I'm quoting him. But Jesus said, by the way, the author of creation, the sustainer of life, said, I can of myself do nothing. In that same verse, he says this, I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. How are you going to know that if you're not seeking God in prayer? In the 8th chapter, he says these words, I always do those things that please him. Once we get saved, we're put on this journey. And this journey goes from where we are to where we need to be. From, from, from our growth here to being one with God, abiding with him. 
which will ultimately lead us to being with him in heaven forever. That's what prayer does. Walking through circumstances, giving him honor, giving him glory. So what did Abram do? He left. He left. God got him there. He didn't think God could take care of him. He left. And then he complicated it further by telling his wife, hey, honey, you sure do look good. Well, she probably gave him a half smile. Uh, honey, when we get down there and they see how beautiful you are, they're going to want you and they're not going to want me. They'll kill me so they can have you. Listen to how he said this. <clears throat> he says, Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake. <laughs> He's acting like, hey, you'll get a blessing out of it because I'll stay alive. So uh, say you're my sister and, and not my wife, and, and it'll, be, it'll be good for me, but it'll be good for you too. You know what you call that? My mama would have called that a lie. But literally, she was his half-sister. I mean, he could have got down and argued. Now, technically, uh, you're not just my, technically, you are my sister as well. Do, do any of y'all know what I mean when I say, it depends on what your definition of is, is? Anybody know what I mean when I say that? We want to take a truth and we want to make it a, 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 I mean, technically it may be right, but no, it's wrong. And he knew it was wrong. By the way, the one who said that, they knew it was wrong. They were just trying to save themselves and get out of trouble. Isn't that what we do? That's what Abram was doing. And it worked well for a while. It, it, be careful what you speculate and say is going to happen because everything that Abram speculated happened just the way he said it. You can speak life into things even when you don't mean to. Well, they took Sarah and she was in the harem. And by the way, it says that, that Abram was benefited because of Sarah. He got rich. I mean, Pharaoh's giving him all these things. I mean, it looks good. But it didn't look good from heaven. And God looked down and said, Boy, I know you love me. But you had not learned enough of me yet. You hadn't learned enough of me yet. So you know what God did? God fought for Abram. How many of y'all have ever lied? No, 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 let me, let me make it plain. How many of y'all have ever sinned? We have any sinners in the house? Amen. How many of you know someone that's a, that's a worse sinner than you? Raise your hand. Oh, now I got a few people out there. Come on now. How many of you know some people that are doing worse things than you're doing? Come on. Now you may not have raised your hand. You just embarrassed your hand, yourself because God's in heaven going, I know you. You know, we can look at what other people do and we can say, now that's wrong. Now, what I'm doing, I, I, I got to answer. You know, there's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. But what they're doing, now that's just wrong. Matter of fact, we can look at them. You know, the Bible tells us, let me find it. I, I was looking in my notes in the first service, and I couldn't find it, so I, I took it and I absolutely underlined it so I wouldn't miss it again. This is Luke 6, verse 41. Why do you look at your, uh, the speck in your brother's eye but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? We got anybody here like that? Why is it that we can say, now, what they do is wrong. That's just wrong. I'd, I'd never do that. But what we do, well, you just don't understand my circumstances. Growing from where we are to where we need to be. And God looked down at that dirty, rotten sinner, Abram, and said, get, get this, listen to me now, this is worth the whole sermon. I love you anyway. You're a dirty, rotten sinner, and I love you with an everlasting love. As a matter of fact, Abram, let me just tell you flat out, there's not a thing that you can do that's going to surprise me, and there's nothing you can do to change how I feel about you. Now, I'm not good at it yet, but I'm working on it. 
That's the way I want to live my life. I don't care what anybody else does. I don't care how they're going to put their self-interest above everybody else's and it's all about them. I'm supposed to love them the way he does. And I'm not going to let anything that they do change how I feel about them. Church, listen to me. We're going through some things we've never faced before. It's once in a century. There's a drought in our life. But I want to tell you this, there's some opportunities there. And it may be hard, and it may be difficult, and you need to humble yourself, and you need to see yourself lowly, seek lowliness before God. You need to have a new life that's on fire in prayer for God. I, I'm doing things now that I want to make sure that I'm exactly where God wants me to be. I, I found a, back in the library, I found some workbooks uh, where the church at one time was going through The Mind of Christ by T.W. Hunt. I pulled it out, and I'm going through it now because I want to know that in my life, I am seeking what God thinks. I want the mind of Christ in my life every day. I'm not going to be presumptuous about that. I want to seek God. But I just want you to know, God wants to bless you. I don't think you caught that. Hold on, let me try it. Where you are in our circumstance, this is an opportunity for such a time as this. God wants to bless He's promised blessings. And even though we're the dirty, rotten sinners that we are, he'll come and fight on our behalf. Look what it says in verse 17. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh. Plagued Pharaoh. What did Pharaoh do wrong? It doesn't tell us anything that Pharaoh did wrong. Abraham was the one that did it wrong, but God still gave him mercy. Y'all listening? Give me five minutes and I'll close. Praise God for mercy. It is in our vocabulary. I'm just not too sure that it's in our heart. Paul understood this and said, because of God's grace and because of his mercy, should we sin so that grace can abound? No, he said. You don't presume upon it, but be grateful for it. Grace is what God gives you that you do not deserve. While Abraham was there, God gave him great bounty through the hands of Pharaoh. But mercy was what God doesn't give you that you do deserve. What Abram deserved was punishment for his sin, but what he received was God's grace. God fought for him. God brought plagues upon Pharaoh on Abraham's behalf. Pastor, what are you trying to say? I just want you to know that God's on your side. I want you to know that God wants to fight for you. There's nobody in this room that knows your troubles better than he does. You may not feel like you can tell anybody else about it. Nobody else in the world may know the things that are bearing down upon your soul and making it hard to carry, but I promise you he knows and he loves you there. He loves you there. And he's not trying to be mean. He's trying to bring blessings. He wants blessings for your life. Overflowing blessings. If not, why would he give us heaven? Is heaven not the very nature of God's goodness given to us? Holding nothing back but, but pouring out bounty on us? God wants to bless you like he did Daniel hey he didn't keep him out of the circumstances that led him to the lion's den but he was with him he didn't keep Joseph out of those circumstances that got him all the way down to the jail cell in Egypt but he was with him he had plans I know things are dark I know things are drear I know things are uncertain but I just want you to know God knows God knows you may say, I'm right here. And he says, I see you right there, but I'm with you in the there. In the right now, in your circumstances, I'm with you there. God fights for you. He's got your back. God wants to bless you. What are you going to learn? What are you going to learn? I love the story of John 8. A woman was caught in the very act 
of adultery. I think it was a setup. And the men took her, the religious people, and they were using her as an example, and they came to Jesus and said, the law said she should be killed. What do you say? Remember, Jesus bent down because he, I think he was getting, he was human. I know he's the son of God, but he was also the son of man. I think he's trying to get his emotions in check, not say the wrong thing. Be, he can only do what he sees the Father do, so he's, he's making sure that he's abiding with God in line with him, saying the right things. And he stood up and said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Y'all remember that? I mean, she was probably taken without any clothes on and thrown down in the middle of the streets with everybody. She probably felt half that tall. But after they dropped the rocks, because they knew they were a dirty, rotten sinner too, and they walked away, Jesus helped her up. I think he probably got some, something put around her. Where are those who accuse you? Listen to this now. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. I think what he's saying is, honey, I love you. Now, I don't condone what you did, but I love you and I forgive you. Grow from this. Learn from this. Understand I'm here for you. Go and do better. Don't miss the opportunity. I mean, how often are we going to get a pandemic? How often is the strongest economy in the world going to get shut down? Where they tell us where we can go and where we can't go. What we do and what we can't do. You may be looking at the world and saying, I don't understand all this. I don't understand why this is going on. Why is God allowing this to happen? I don't know and you don't know, but he does. Don't miss the opportunity. Understand that God's with us here. God wants to bless us here. Let's not miss this. This is going to be glorious. This is going to be great. If the church can get in tune, if the church can fire up in prayer, if the church can charge God and want to be close, I'm getting older, folks, and I'm losing my hearing. Wife, don't say amen. But you know what I've learned when I'm losing my hearing? If I can't hear, I might need to get a little closer. This is an opportunity to get close. The teenagers aren't going to understand this. They haven't had enough life experience yet. But they're going to look back on this. The ones that are starting out with their family and their kids are small and they're worried. Do I send my kids to kindergarten? Those people need to hear a word from God. Those people need to trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not into their own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct the path. they got to grow. You know, I, as a parent, I'm like the rest of y'all. There's some things that my kids went through and I look back on it and I think, oh, why in the world did you do that? But I was growing. I was growing as a parent. I was growing as a person. I was growing as a child of God. See, one thing, y'all know, y'all have already figured this out, y'all don't have a perfect preacher. And I've got a thousand people who can tell you the things about me. And by the way, isn't it funny how the world will always tell you the worst thing about you? Isn't that funny? They don't want you to tell the worst thing about them, but they want to tell the worst thing about you. But you see, what I'm learning is I don't worry about the speck in my brother's eye. I got this great big plank I got to get out of my home. I don't worry about this pandemic or this circumstances, all that. I don't have to worry about all those things. All I got to do is take this time to get as close to Christ as I can. I don't want to miss the opportunity. I don't want to repeat this either. I want to get the most out of it right now. What is it God's saying to you? The most important decision in all of life to trust Him as your personal Savior and Lord. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, it's the most important decision you'll ever make. It is the journey that will place you on a close walk with God and blessing and joy and peace and love, and it'll take you all the way to heaven one day. Throughout all of, all of eternity, you will be blessed. But if you already are a Christian, 
What is it God's trying to tell you now? Are you just waiting to get to heaven one day? Are you just looking for God to, to do more outwardly blessings? God may be wanting to use you for such a time as this. What is it God's trying to say? What is it God's trying to do? One of the words we need to remember is to recalibrate. Maybe God's letting us go through this so that we can recalibrate and look at things differently. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for this opportunity of this day, for this opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, O Lord, my God, for giving us a word of a great man, the man that we know of as the father of faith, but yet in this time his faith was weak and he was having to grow. He was a dirty, rotten sinner. He messed up. He lied about his wife that he loved so very much. He put her in harm's way because of his unbelief. But Lord, thank you that you didn't just judge him there. You fought for him there. And thank you, Lord, for fighting for us. Father, I don't know what you're saying to the people in this room and those that are watching online, but I just pray that you'll put your arms of love and draw them close and let them know that you're bigger than these circumstances. You're bigger than the heartache. You're the God who can. And that you want to bless us so very much. So, Father, honor us. Lord, if there's anyone here today that hears my voice, that needs to repent of their sins, believe in you, ask you to come in their life and give their life to following you as a Christian, as a worshiper of you. May they pray and ask you to come into their life and save them. May they do that today. Lord, for those that are already Christians, Lord, may we recalibrate and give you praise and glory for letting us walk this way. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.